Hello, and welcome to what is, at the time of recording, the lightest ever stock manned mission to Tylo and back in KSP. At least I haven't been able to find any evidence of a lower mass mission, but do let me know if I've managed to miss one. The craft itself weighs less than 5 tonnes, and I'll be discussing the engineering behind it, as well as all the ways I managed to minimise its mass over the course of the video, but for now let's detail its takeoff and ascent into Kerbin orbit. Engine ignition starts as soon as the craft loads onto the runway, as due to the lack of any brakes it will start rolling backwards and the engine would have to waste fuel countering the negative velocity if we didn't start straight away. As soon as it gains enough lift we pitch up and jettison the wheels to shed mass and more importantly reduce the drag. We don't need the wheels again anyway. Due to the lack of a tail fin for your control, the craft wobbles a bit at first but becomes stable enough once it picks up speed. We pitch up until prograde is at about 35 degrees and then settle there and let the 7 g's of acceleration take us up to just shy of 1500 meters per second. One of my favourite features of this craft is its exploding wings. To get into the air, only a single elevon and two basic fins are needed. The basic fins are the lightest wing in the game, but they have a pretty terrible heat resistance, so once the craft is punching through the atmosphere, they overheat and disintegrate. Seeing as at this point in the flight wings aren't necessary, being rid of them once again helps to reduce drag and mass. The whiplash engine flames out at around 23 kilometers just as our apoapsis reaches space, but we hold on to it whilst we coast on upwards as its weight actually helps the craft to slice through the rest of the atmosphere. There are many reasons why the Whiplash is the best engine for this craft, really. First, as an air-breathing engine, it is much more efficient than any rocket engine, and so less fuel and therefore less mass is required to make it to a suborbital trajectory. The other air-breathing engines also have drawbacks, which meant that the Whiplash was really my only choice. The Panther jet engine is lighter and just as efficient as the Whiplash, and it also has a wide gimbal range which would make the takeoff easier, but it simply doesn't provide enough thrust. The Rapier provides more thrust at a higher speed, but guzzles fuel faster and can't accelerate as quickly, and it also weighs about 200 kilograms more. At 30 seconds to apoapsis, the fairing is jettisoned and the next stage is deployed. The placement and shape of every part was key to making this craft work. I think the clearest example of this are the R12 donut tanks, which have a good wet to dry mass ratio, and also allow the spark engine to burn through the hollow centre, meaning that no other engines are necessary. The fuel tanks are drained one by one and dropped once empty to maximise delta V. Once all of the liquid fuel for Kerbin Ascent is used, the craft spins round and the final push into orbit is achieved via an iron engine, which is the reason for the nighttime launches. Once we reach this point, the sonar panels can generate electric charge and the iron engine can put it to use. There isn't much of a battery bank to run off with this craft and so using 100% throttle isn't possible. But this problem is negated by just slightly angling the craft's thrust downwards to make sure that we don't start descending back into the atmosphere. And with that, the craft is in orbit. It now weighs 1.81 tonnes, less than 40% of its original mass of 4.99975 tonnes, the pilot's mass included. Here begins a chain of small burns at periapsis which kick the craft into a high elliptical orbit in preparation for the final escape burn. I seem to be in the minority of KSB players as I like to play it on a career save and so one of the things I like to do in my game is to keep space debris free. This mission is no exception and therefore the first tank of iron fuel will be taking us all the way to Tylo before we dispose of it. To get to Tylo, I use the Kerbin Eve Kerbin Kerbin Gravity Assist route, meaning that instead of heading directly to the outer system, we first send the craft inwards so that we can use Eve's gravity to slingshot us into a higher orbit of Kerbal, followed by a couple of passes by Kerbin which will boost the craft all the way up to Jules' orbit. 
As you might have noticed, this mission forgoes any luxury, and so too does it require Valentina, our pilot, to sit very patiently indeed. Whilst I'm faffing about adjusting manoeuvre nodes and conducting tiny 0.1 meter per second burns, I'd like to talk a little more about the design of this craft. It's the 68th iteration of the design, and I've made it available on the Steam Workshop for anybody who might be interested or would like to take a closer look at the craft themselves. Most of the changes over the many iterations were tweaks to the Kerbin ascent stages and landing gear, as the 5 ton limit I gave myself meant that I really had to optimise every aspect of the design. For this reason, every fuel tank on the craft is full at launch in order to optimise the wet to dry mass ratio. The fairing is as small but as aerodynamic as possible, and there are only as many control surfaces and air intakes as are necessary, one of each. There are ways to achieve a lighter craft though. I suspect that it's possible for a similar design to use even less lifting surfaces and landing gear. I also had about one unit of liquid fuel remaining that went unused, and I'm sure that the ascent profile could be better. Aside from that, the Making History expansion allows for a custom launch site which would enable takeoff from a higher initial altitude. You could also stretch a launch clamp super high, providing you don't take the mass of the launch clamp itself as part of the mass of the craft, and then drop the craft, enabling its pickup speed that way. There are these suggestions, and I'm sure many other solutions to the challenge of saving on mass. My capture into the dual system and rendezvousing with Tylo could have also been slightly more efficient, and in general, a more thought out flight plan would make this mission possible with significantly less fuel. In all honesty, I just want to see somebody improve upon this mission, as I know that it can be done. When plotting my course to Tylo, I aimed for a periapsis of around 15 kilometers, and to arrive at a shallow angle in relation to its orbit, both of which factored into saving delta V. With no atmosphere, error braking isn't possible around Tylo, and so it's necessary to capture with the iron engine. This causes a few problems. The single battery on board the craft only has a capacity of 200 electric charge, and being as far out from the sun as we are, the solar panels can't provide a strong flow of electricity to the engine. For this reason, I plan to capture on the sun-facing side of Tylo to capitalise on the little sunlight available. I soon found a flaw in this plan, however, when I realised that whilst I had aimed for the sun-facing side, I had forgotten about Joule, the gas giant that was between the craft and the sun. As such, I burned as much as possible at periapsis, before completing the capture all the way out on the edge of Tyler's sphere of influence, where the solar panels could receive the sunlight. Even despite the inefficiency of this burn, we capture out Tyler with ample xenon gas remaining, and once we raise our trajectory back above the surface where it belongs, can begin winding down our orbit over multiple ion burns at periapsis. The first xenon tank that brought us all the way from Kerbin is finally empty, and so we temporarily set a crash course for Tylo, detach the tank, and return to a safe orbit, waving the tank a teary goodbye, as we do. Once a craft arrives at its parking orbit around Tylo, it will be travelling at over 2,100 meters per second relative to the surface, meaning that to land, we'll need to cancel all of that velocity, and then accelerate back up to just over 2,100 meters per second to return to orbit. Tyler's page on the KSP wiki states that you need a lot of fuel to land and take off here, but we're going to do it with less than one ton of fuel. To begin the descent, the iron engine burns retrograde, lowering the periapsis to around 4,300 meters. We then initiate a spin on the craft, and decouple at just the right moment, such that the angular momentum of the spin becomes linear momentum, and the iron stage is hurled back up to a safe orbit, whilst the lander is placed into a suborbital trajectory. And quickly tapping time warp locks the craft back into position.
An earlier version of this craft had the two half separate via a stack separator, so that the weight of the decoupler wouldn't remain attached to the iron stage. However, as I don't want to generate any space debris and the craft lacks any probe control, that method would mean that the pilot would have to return the iron stage back up to its parking orbit manually, and then EVA over to the lander, which would mean spending EVA fuel that will be essential later. I think it's really difficult to find any good uses for the stack separators in the game, when decouplers and docking ports are nearly always just as suitable. Because we left all of the electric charge and reaction wheels in orbit, the lander relies on just the gimbal of the spark engine to orient itself during the descent. It's important to burn as flat and as late as you can to make sure that as little fuel as possible is spent countering gravity. Once the first frontal tank is empty, it is jettisoned, and we have to be careful to dodge it as we continue to burn at full throttle. We have to angle up slightly to stop us crashing into the surface too early, and then we jettison the rear fuel tank, leaving us with just the single fuel tank, engine, command seat, and Valentina. The thrust to weight ratio is pretty high at this point, so we just point retrograde and briefly cut the engine before coming in for the final touchdown. Now, when I watch the footage back, I realise something odd happens here. Due to my bad piloting, the lander hit the surface a bit harder than I'd intended, with the donut tank making first contact with the ground. The impact tolerance for this part is supposed to be 6 meters per second, but nevertheless it survived, so after the mission I replicated the scenario again using the mission builder tool, and once again I was able to impact the fuel tank into the surface without it breaking. The game is fully stock, with no cheats enabled, and the only mods I'm using are Better Time Warp and Kerbal Alarm Clock, so I don't really know what's happening here. My best guess as to why this is happening is that, as you might be able to tell, a lot of the in-game settings like the train detail and the graphics are turned down pretty low so that my computer is able to run the game. And perhaps this is having some sort of effect? I don't know. Regardless to dispel any doubts, there's a link in the description to an uncut landing from the same starting orbit in which the craft touches down at less than 6 meters per second and ends up with more delta V. We've made it all the way to the surface of Tylo on a craft that started off less than 5 tons, and now all we need to do is get back again. Valentina stretches her legs and plants a flag, and as this is a career save, we also remember to collect a surface sample and make a mission report. Valentina pushes the little lander all the way to the top of the nearest hill, which took quite some time. We didn't land in a particularly good spot for taking off again, so even just a small gain in elevation will help to ensure that we don't smash into the side of any mountains on the journey back into orbit. Talking of which, whilst landing on Tylo is generally considered the hard part, our lander doesn't have enough fuel to get all the way into orbit on its own now, so once we've accelerated as fast as we can with it, we disembark from the command seat and continue the ascent using just the thrust of the EVA pack. Being careful to expend as little of the limited fuel that there is left as possible, we slowly make our way back to rendezvous with the iron craft left in orbit. I'd done a lot of testing prior to flying this mission in full, but one thing I hadn't tested was the journey from Tylo back to LKO. With Valentina in the seat of the craft, I realised that I had way more Delta V than I needed, so my journey back to Kerbin was pretty lazy and inefficient. This is another area where the mission can be definitely improved upon, as you could probably get away with having even half as much of the fuel for this stage. Because of this, the journey back really isn't that interesting, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk a little more about the mission in general. This is the first time I've made a KSP video, and at the moment I don't really have any plans to make any more, but I thought it was worthwhile filming this mission for a few reasons. Firstly, I'm really surprised that more videos on low mass Tylo landings don't exist. When I realised the gap in the market was there, so to speak, I kind of had to do it. 
As I said at the start of the video, I can't currently find any sub 5 ton Tyler missions, and unless there's one that I missed, then this mission will have set a world record, which I think is pretty exciting. I'm sure there will be better, even lower mass missions, and I really look forward to seeing what is done differently and improved upon in them. It's worth mentioning a few missions by other KSP players too, namely Nephrim's and Strats and Blitz's Dual 5 missions, as well as Bradley Wistons' low mass missions. As you might be able to tell, I enjoy videos that go into all the nerdy detail behind the designs of the crafts, and I apologise to Brad for just implying that he's a bit of a nerd, but you know, it's a good thing. I've linked to all of these in the description, along with some other KSB channels and sources that, in some way, influenced this mission. I've also spent quite a bit of time in this game, and it's taught me a great deal, so I think that this mission was a good way to combine and utilise a lot of the concepts that I've learned to do with aerodynamics and rocket engineering and orbital mechanics. The craft makes use of air breathing engines, iron engines and rocket engines, and employs a bunch of weight saving techniques that I just wouldn't have been able to do when I first started playing. So I like to think that this mission was a culmination of my learning, like a player's dissertation or something like that. And of course, I love seeing people push the boundaries of what's possible in this game, so I hope that this low mass video might catch the eye of the KSP community and encourage more players to design missions like it. Anyway, after some dodgy gravity assists and more iron burns, we finally get into an elliptical orbit of Kerbin. While the craft still has some fuel left, we use error braking to lower ourselves into a circular orbit. The first error braking pass comes dangerously close to overheating the solar panels, which can't be retracted like their heavier counterparts, so all of the subsequent passes are performed at a slightly higher altitude where the heating will be less intense. Heat shields aren't necessary due to the extremely low mass and high drag of the craft, and surprisingly, we don't even have to roll to disperse the heat. Only the drama of final re-entry stands in the way before Valentina can return to curb in soil, and dramatic it will be. We set a shallow trajectory with a periapsis of 58 kilometers or so to ensure that the craft and the pilot don't overheat as they plow through the atmosphere. The craft points retrograde such that the engine takes the brunt of the heat, and because the drag of the craft is so high, the solar panels don't even break under the stress, which is crucial to how we'll come into land. I'd planned to use Valentina's personal parachute, but despite this being version 1.5.1, the chute wouldn't deploy for whatever reason, so I had to improvise. The solar panels provide a tiny bit of lift, meaning that by angling the craft, I could influence its direction a bit. Due to the lack of landing gear, the runway didn't really seem appropriate, and I've heard that the VAB makes for an easy recovery, so as Valentina falls from the sky, she braces for impact. The Tylo lander may have been able to withstand the hard impact, but this time luckily we weren't taken off again, so the mission could end with a bang. With Valentina safely returned to the space centre, our mission is complete. This has been a sub 5 ton fully stock mission to the surface of Tylo and back that, as a bonus, left no space debris. Thank you for watching and putting up with the terrible presentation. I hope that you enjoyed the ride, and I look forward to seeing this done with an even lighter craft at some point soon.